you in future. This is the first one, first GABAM lectures, and it is beginning with Hans Gert Helenkemper. Today, uh, he is our guest speaker, Professor Hans Gert Helenkemper from the University of Cologne, Germany, Department of Byzantine Studies. His area of research is mainly late antique and Byzantine archaeology and architecture, historical geography, <coughs> urban history, and cultural history of the Byzantine Empire. Besides lecturing on Byzantine archaeology in different uh, universities, he was the director of Römisch Germanisches Museum between 1978 and 2010. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and he was a uh, creator of many exhibitions in Cologne. Hans Gert has many publications on the Byzantine archaeology, historical geography, and urban history. It will take a long time to list them here. But just to mention the Tabula Imperi Byzantini series, he will, uh, this will be enough to recognize the scope of his contribution to the field. <clears throat> Currently, Hans Gert is co-working with Gabam on the Damatris Palace project at Samandra. Today, he is going to speak on the summer palaces or, or residences, mostly, of the Byzantine emperors in Constantinople. And his title is Beyond the Great Palace, Imperial Summer Residences in Constantinople. Hans Gert, please. Dear Professor Akurek, dear Engin, dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on Sunday a colleague passed away. I did dedicate my lecture to Arzu Öztürk. I thank you for the warm introduction and for the invitation to speak here on behalf of uh, Gaman, Gaban. I am pleased to introduce you to some aspects of imperial residences beyond the great palace with a focus on the Bosphorus. The title shows a map drawn around 1700 as 1730 by Johann Jakob Andelfinger, printed in Augsburg with some place names. You see the villages and castles, for instance, Ortakö, Bebek, Rumlehisar, Kadikö, Fener, Kandija, Chibuklu, Anadoluhisar, and others. They are in the right order but geographically not yet on the right place. But this is the starting point for my lecture. It was not the first class of senators Constantine the Great could find for his new senate in Constantinople. The more noble families, the old senatorial families lived in the West, in Rome, and were there in the Roman Empire, in Italy, Constantine had to be content with those from the East, mostly poorer and less noble. Some of the candidates refused their nomination. Constantine was not tempting, or uh, pardon, Constantinople was not tempting for all of them at times, the province, either Cappadocia, Syria or Egypt, 
was more attractive than the new capital. Constantine and his sons and his followers were constantly engaged to improve the living conditions and the economic chances for the new elite in order to assure their presence in Constantinople. The emperor tried to lure them to the new capital with stunning careers, but also with, a, with, with personal palaces in the city, with sea view either to the Sea of Marmara or, perhaps less attractive, probably, to the Golden Horn and to the Bosphorus. <coughs> the state treasury paid for the amenities, for fresh water, sewers, for the colonnaded streets on boulevards, for public security, and the emperor paid for luxury villas, ready built, apparently by leading and known architects for the sonatas. Property on the immediate seashore, that is in the first row, was greatly sought after, despite the sea walls. You have left a glimpse of such a wall, uh, of such a palace, for instance, in the palace of Marina on the southern uh, seashore. It was already a long-standing Italian tradition for the noble society since the days of the Roman Republic to own a residence in the city and a villa beyond the walls. This meant in Constantinople or for Constantinople, either in the west, in Thrace, or in the broad strip, for instance, the broad strip between Atakö and Kazim Pasha, or at the Bithynian coast down to Pendik, and naturally to both sides of the Bosphorus. That was good for the emperor, for the imperial families, for the senators, and for the other high-ranking officials on and aristocrats. Already during the first generation, that is in the second quarter of the fourth century, the church receives or acquires, like in Rome, apparently also white property, for instance, in Tarabia. We will hear later on it. At the end of the fourth century, some three generations of the founding of the new capital, we see in the sources the first traces of aristocratic property outside the city. We find neighborhoods, the right translation would be Mahalala, named after real historical persons. Apparently, the generation of the first owners after the city's uh, foundation. For instance, Eutropius, prime minister in the time he owned the Bay of Kalabish between Moda and Fenerbahce. There he had his villa with a splendid sea view towards the peninsula and to the great palace, or Rufinos, consul in 392, famous landlord on the coast, on the coast in Jadebostan. He was for some time omnipotent minister of Emperor Theodosius I, and he uh, was really the strong man in the 90s of the fourth century. These early names, bound to the property, I attested the sources sometimes over half a millennium. The families or the owners were already gone, but the names remained. To, tra to trace these stories, 
of prime property and to reconstruct imperial landscape around Constantinople is part of my historical and topographical research in the suburban neighborhoods of Eastern Thrace and Western Bithynia. I am concerned with the layers of, with the layers underneath the modern and the Ottoman city. It is the older city and the older history, partly unknown or not yet written up of the Bosphorus and the Sea of Marmara, as well as the seashores of the hinterland. It is about the Byzantine millennium of these landscapes. If you find some parallels to the actual situation of the Straits, I mean the real estate, any resemblance is purely coincidental. You cannot catch uh, the Bosphorus really in pictures. There are hundreds of thousands of pictures, hundreds of books. Every one of you has its own idea and notion about the Bosphorus and the landscapes around. So the following few pictures and maps are a sort of entree to my stories. Please the first. The Bosphorus seen from the space. The long straits, the Bosphorus, from the Black Sea down to the shores of northeastern Marmara to the Princess Islands. A bird's view of the middle Bosphorus to the north between the two bridges and the eastern base of Djengelke, Kuleli, Kandili, and before the northern um, second bridge, the mouth of the sweet waters of Asia at Kuchiksu. An etching of Melling or by Melling, the Bosphorus from a garden pavilion to the Bassinian shore near Kandili. The Bosphorus as a modern historical map in Roman and Byzantine times, drawn by Cliff Foss for the Barrington Atlas, with some of the place names I will mention. The Bosphorus from Tarabia, uh, Tarabia to Rufene, <coughs> Jada Bostan here in the south. Hagios Mamas, today Don Mabachche, Anna Blues, Kuru Cheshme, or Anna Rutke, Sostenion, today Istinje, Terapia, Tarabia, or Metanoia, probably the area of Kandili. Finally, Sofianai, today's Jengel Kei. A reduced map with some of the places discussed in this lecture shows, for instance, Pegai Dolabdere in Kazimpasha, just 1,100 meters here from this spot here down um, beyond Talabashe. And other places, um, so we can go further. Um, we have um, Dolma Bachche. Next. 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 Um, pardon? Um, the Bay of uh, no, of um, yeah, of Tarabia. And uh, ne next, no, uh, that was the first one was of uh, Stinia, and, and this is um, uh, Tarabia, the new hotel, or rebuilt hotel. Some 
it is an open discussion where we should look for the Michaelion in uh, um, Sostinje um, and the neighboring palace of uh, Leo, but in a moment I will speak about. And the cove of Tarabia, former Tarabia, was... Um, for, uh, with a view to the south, and the imperial palace should be sought along the northern case. I think in this part here, and afterwards when I speak about uh, the um, Petrax pa uh, palace in this corner. So, uh, we go to the last picture, and this will stand till uh, uh, the end beforehand. Some historical maps, um, which are sometimes useful um, for identifying places or what at that time people thought about uh, the topography of uh, the straits. Next. And that is the first really well-measured map uh, given by Carl Fair and uh, redone by De Bocage in the early 19th century. That is the real, real uh, point of first very good cartography on the uh, straits. September the 2nd, 464, a disastrous fire destroyed the inner city of Constantinople. The fire spread to the sea walls and south down to the Golden Horn. The chronicles are taciturn. The real dimension of the catastrophe are shown by the fact that the emperor, Leo, leaves the great palace at Sultan Ahmed and escapes to the Bosphorus. He can only watch the city burn. Leo had a broad view from the European shore, from the village Diplokion, then named Hagios Mamas, after the popular martyr from Kaiseria, near now Kaiseri. Hagios Mamas is today Besiktas and the shoreline of Dolmabachche. Leo went to Hagios Mamas because there was an imperial estate near the burning city, but far enough from the enduring and penetrating smell of the ruins. The Empress stays here for more than six months, the whole winter till springtime of the year 465. Due to this crucial event, we learn more about the imperial residence at Dolmabachche, which took a considerable area along the seashore. Beside the imperial apartments and the Basilica of St. Thomas, there was a small newly built private harbor, pardon me, is there a possibility to have a little bit more light here, uh, this uh, dark to see my mask, oh yeah, that helps a lot. Besides the imperial apartments and the Basilica of St. Thomas, there was a small newly built private harbor and a sigma. There is a spacious portico open to the sea, a great and rare monument of urban design, developed in Roman architecture and repeated in the round Constantinian Forum in Constantinople. It must be a great architecture. 
The Imperial Palace was connected with a private hippodrome, a Circus Maximus like the At Medane in Sultan Ahmed, or the circuses in, for instance, Thessaloniki or um, in Antioch. But here in St. Mamas, we have a very special situation, a residence cum hippodrome like the palace of Maxentius in Rome, also extra murus beyond the walls, a private circus for the imperial pressure and for small select people and public. The public had to come from the capital. The few fishermen of Besiktas could not fill the terraces. Leo's choice demonstrates that just in the midst of the fifth century, there was a fully equipped palace. But the name of the imperial builder, the founder, is unknown. A short, isolated notice in the sources reveals an indication. Emperor Makian, who reigned 450 to 457, apparently sends from the the collections from the imperial collections in the city, bronze statues and porphyry sculptures as a sign of his special dedication to the imperial estate of St. Mamas. At this time, the building in the midst of the fifth century, the building of the palace was apparently finished or nearly finished, either Theodosius II or Machian can claim the foundership. Palace, palace church, harbor, the colonnaded prospect, the sigma, the circus, and all this needs place and space. A space not available in the ancient village in Besiktas at the mouth of the Flamuadere that is today the Barbaros uh, Boulevard near today's Iskele. Therefore, we have to expand the palace area from the Barbaros Monument in Besiktas down to the clock tower of Dolma Varche, a distance of some 700 meters. The Palazzo of Mamas had a long imperial history I will come back in a moment. Another story first. In the year 409 AD, a boy was born in the vicinity of Samosata on the Euphrates. In the Syriac monastery near, nearby, he got the name Daniel. Years later, he leaves his family, joins the monastic community, and travels down to Antioch. At Telanissos, today Derseman, just beyond the Turkish border in Syria, he meets Simeon, the great living pillar saint. Daniel is deeply impressed, and an old man tells him, quote, go to Byzantium you will see a second Jerusalem with the name Constantinople. The whole story which follows is told by an anonymous author who has written as eyewitness the biography of Daniel, reflecting the social and political background of this time, that is, the second half of the fifth century. Daniel goes to Constantinople, speaking only his native language, Syriac. All his lifetime, he needs an interpreter. He finds as a dwelling an old Roman temple near Anablus on the Thracian shore. Anablus today, Kuro Cheshme or Arnautke, is already a famous place at the time. The church and the monastery of St. Michael, the Michaelion, is the rising center of pilgrimage situated on the coastal strip at or near Arnautke, even down to Akintibono. 
a key point for the Byzantine topography of the Bosphorus. Daniel includes himself in the abandoned pagan temple and with his strange Syrian piety, he attracts more and more devoted people from the city and the suburbs. Nobody can understand him, but he works curse and gives consolation much to the distress and anger of the nearby clergy of St. Michael. <coughs> A pious man from the Euphrates is troubling the ecclesiastical hier hierarchy. The patriarch is spelled by Daniel's ascetism and his rigid belief. Daniel becomes a living saint as a popular hero in the eyes of the world around him. He is now a known figure on the Bosphoran society. News are spread in the capital that the celebrated pillar saint Simeon had died in 459. A monk brings as a relic from Syria Simeon's famous leather tunic. The monk finds his way to Daniel and offers him Simeon's leather tunic. This moment, this moment is a turning point point in his life. Daniel is 50 years old when he decides to mount a pillar like the, his shining example, Simeon. Daniel is now accepted by the court society. The Empress Eudoxia, daughter of Theodosius and wife of Valentinian III, visits Daniel and quote, she says, I heard everything from my son Olybrius about you. She said, therefore I come both to enjoy seeing your face to face and to receive a perfect blessing. And the wider imperial family, Leo, Eudoxia, Olybrius, is deeply involved in the affair with Daniel. The healing saint becomes a trophy. And by the way, we hear about imperial real estate in the vicinity. Emperor Leo asks Daniel for prayers for the birth of a son. The son is born in 467. The emperor donates Daniel a new column. But this is not enough. The emperor offers the saint a double column for more comfort. The pillar's completion becomes a public holiday. Daniel's bi biographer sees nearly the whole city, that's a quote, nearly the whole city coming up the Bosphorus. And the emperor takes part. During his visits and ceremon uh, ceremonies, he stays and that's a key point. He stays at the palace, at his palace, beside the Michaelion, St. Michael's Monastery. We have here clear evidence for an imperial palace built in Annapolis, Istidia, by Leon. The Bosphorus is part of the political life of Byzantium. In 466, for example, Gubatius, king of Lazica, that is far away in the Caucasus, is on state visit in Constantinople, and he goes on procession to Daniel and stays probably as a state guest in the imperial palace in Istinia. And after his exile in his Isoria, and back to imperial power, Emperor Zenon is revisiting Daniel, a well-prepared and calculated political demonstration. Imperial processions in the inner city passing the regia on the Messe, that is the Divan Yolu, are well-documented in the books of ceremonies. But here on the Bosphorus, 
we have additional examples of imperial presence, pilgrimage, and staging. And the imperial palace connected with a major sanctuary of the city makes sense for reposing, for staying overnight, and for imperial receptions. When Emperor Justinian ascended the throne in 527, nothing was left to buy on the Bosphorus. Apparently, all had been sold to imperial families, to the senators, to the magnates, or to the church, to the monasteries. Some real estate came on the market because their owners lost their property by imperial confiscation. Procopius, the biographer of this time, relates such stories in his secret history. And, and in his books on the buildings, he has a chapter on the Bosphorus and praises the delights of sailing, the pleasurable sights of the, for the eyes, the facilities for anchorage, the shores of either side displaying the woods and the lovely meadows, and all the other details which lie open to view from the city." Quote, uh, end of quote. Justinian did not build new palaces on the Bosphorus. There were already several on both sides, Hagias Mamas, Sustenium, Terapia, Metanoia, and perhaps others whose name is unknown to us. Justinian built his own great project in Hebdomon in the west, today Bakerke, and in Hieria, today Fenerbahce in the east on the Asian side. <coughs> So we have at least already two of the football clubs, Fenerbahce and Besiktas, um, with a stunning view towards his capital. Over and above, he acted as an urbanist and landscape architect. He rebuilt not only the churches of St. Michael in Adablus, but also in Brochtroy, that is on the uh, Asian side at Candeli or at um, Vanike. Churches of prestige and apparently churches of imperial origin. It was not only the radical rebu rebuilding of already venerable temples, but also an achievement of landscaping. Procopius gives some details. That, uh, but uh, the, long, the quote is long and uh, go further on. Um, Porokopis is not only describing an architectural feature, but at the same moment, the effects for the joy of life. He's em emphasizing the sea view, which is still important till today, um, as a manzara, a keyword for the Bosphorus. The Church of St. Michael is a domed architecture on the marble platform of the sea. A look like today, like the mosque of Ochtakö of the 19th century. This dramatic scenery, a white pearl on the edge between land and sea, was well calculated <laughs> effect by the emperor and 1300 years later by the sultan, the prayer house the church as a political symbol. And despite all the spectacular new church buildings by Justinian, we do not hear anything about con uh, connected palaces like in Sustenian, Istinia. There was an imperial palace at Candidi on the Bithynian side, which Justinian disdained to, to use. The, uh, the palace might have been built by the family of Zeno, for sure lavishly adorned with marbles from the Mediterranean. It was quite sure the Theodora's instigation to convert this palace into, quote of 
Procopius, a refuge for women who re repented of their past life, lives so that they might be able to clean the, away the sins of their lives in the brothel. Therefore, they call the domicile of such women repentance, metanoia. It became Magdalene's house. And Procopes adds the sovereigns, and he means Justinian and Theodora, have endowed this convent with an ample income of money. There were many such endowments on the Bosphorus to serve the imperial and noble families, the church and the monasteries. There were prominent neighbors such as Juliana Anikia, who had property on the Asian side, in all probability a personal summer retreat, where she founded a church of Theodorcus St. Mary. Juliana, from her old Western imperial family, was extremely rich and charitable. She stood in concurrence with Justinian. She built also the famous Polyuctus uh, church in Saracha, Saracha on, um, on the peninsula, but it was a church on her own ground, her palace church just beside her residence. The excavation site of the Polyuctus church in the city gives us an idea of the area of her personal palace with a fine view to the house of the Marmara Sea. Donners from the neighborhood of Honuatu on the Asian side, perhaps near the Göksu, made a precious gift to her. The famous codex of Dioscorides, the book of the medical plants today in the National Library in Vienna. And not far away from Honoratu in Zengelke, Justinian's nephew, Justine, and his <coughs> wife, the later imperial couple, had property. Justine built here one of their palaces, a favorite place named after his wife, Sophia, Sophianae. The historian Theophanes remarks, even some 200 years later, in a critical tone, that the palace was endowed with broad variety of costly marbles. The luxurious, the lectures of marbles were often an occasion for critics. For instance, the marble revetments of the Patriarch's Palace. So there are so many stories to reconstruct about the palaces on either sides of the streets. For example, the stories of Emperor Michael III. He starts reigning in 842 as charioteer. He was a maniac of horse races, and he did it in the already cited Hippodrome of St. Mamas. And in the night of from the 23rd to the 24th September 867, dramatic scenes took place in the palace of pa um, St. Mamas. The almighty Byzantine Emperor Michael III was murdered in the bedroom of his favorite residence at the age of 27. Nearly half a century later, the palace was pillaged, perhaps partly burnt down by the Bulgars. After a renovation, the palace served imperial purposes for another century. Then, the palace of St. Mamas became the new quarter of Russian merchants, Russian pilgrims, Russian tourists, like today's Aksaray. There are occult stories about the palace of Asaber, brother of the patriarch John Grammatikos in Ochtake, later imperial monastery of St. Phocas. Today we are still in um, Ochtake, a church of St. Phocas, founded by Basil I.
But other references help us to get an idea about the possible origins, origins of the imperial palace. Tarabia is a good example for methods of research. By combining and interpreting different mentions in literary sources, we are able to reconstruct an outline of the local history. The fifth century interference of the patriarch Atticus demonstrates the metropolitan interest into the village and the seaside at Pharmacias. It might be that at that time, imperial families had already real estate and property at Tarabia earlier than the church. The patriarchate kept manifestly over more than more than 1,000 years their property in Tarabia. Finally, in 1655, the Synod in Constantinople decided to sell their rights and their property for 40 florins to the metropolitan see of Derkos, today Terkos or Dursu. The Archbishop of Derkos took residence in Tarabia. The bishop's house or the bishop's palace was finally burned down on the 6th uh, September 1955. It is understandable that we find here the grounds for founding a palace just at this given place. The local climate is often praised as decisive or a reason for Byzantine, in Byzantine sources, but for sure there are also, there's also another reason. In Constantine Cavafy's oldest documented poem with the title Leaving Therapia, he emphasized, quote, the fine sights near which you would wish ever to stay, end of quote. The most lovely aspect is the site, the Manzara. Even in early and middle Byzantine time, you had to pay thousands of gold solidi more for first row property. And as the last case study, today I take you to the vicinity from here to Kazim Pasha. Kazim Pasha is known in the learned literature as Pegai, the sources known as the site of a palace of Emperor Basil I and later for the huge Ottoman shipyards and the palace of the Kaputan Pasha. Apparently, nobody tried a closer look to the Byzantine topography. Walking through the bottom of the valley of Kazim Pasha or along the northern shore of the Halic, the Golden Horn is not one of the loveliest pastimes in search of a lost Byzantine palace. But the notion, Pegai, sources, became, after some frustrating wa walks, a hint and a direction towards the Ayasmala, or Hayasmata, in the valley of the Dolapdere, just down at the bottom of Talabashe. On the western slope of Dolaptere, we find the Panagia Evangelistria church with an ayasma, the Fanurius ayasma, and the Hagios Dimitrios church from 1798 with the Hagios Saranambos chapel with ayasma, and finally, the Hagios Athanasios church with an ayasma. All four churches date from the 18th and 19th mm -hmm. century. But the springs and the watercourses go back to unknown periods. The concentration of four sources above the stream in the valley. In a triangle of some nine hectares is a strong argument for the lost site of the palace of Pegai, the sources. This site is astonishing because the relief of the upper Kazan Pasha does not allow to see the sacred city because of the bending slopes on both sides of Tolaptere. 
in consequence, the emperor has chosen, if the locali localization is correct, a hidden place close to the city, lacking panoramic view to the Golden Horn. This Maison de Plaisance seems to have been an idyllic garden mansion, and in the 17th, 17th century, one would say a solitude. An old path led to the north, to the woods of Belgrade, and to the excellent hunting grounds, a favorite pastime of Basil. If you imagine for a moment the valley, the valley of Dolabdere, just the mentioned 1,100 meters from here as the crow flies, and the falling slope of Talabasha, without houses, only as a valley with steep slopes and a vegetation of scrubs, bushes, small trees, and perhaps vineyards and gardens, several sources, and a small perennial stream on the bottom of the valley, you get the impression of a lovely, small locus amenus. The valley, or parts of it, was evidently already in imperial hands in early Byzantine times, but there were some unspecified imperial lodgings. We may speculate, perhaps for hunting purposes. In any case, the Vita Basiliae written by Constantine Porphyrogenitus, his grandson, narrates that Basil erected very new buildings for the from the foundations. That means a complete rebuilding of the palace. Moreover, Basil founded five churches in the precinct for the, prefer uh, for the prophets Elias and Eliseus, for Constantine the Great, for the 42 martyrs of Sebaste, and two chapels for Theotokos and, um, and the Mother of God. Five churches in a suburban palace founded by one ruler is not the usual case in the sources. But we can take some conclusions from the testimonial. The church patrons are a personal and political program of the emperor. We find Elias and the Theodokos as favorite patrons in other palaces of the time, in the Great Palace and in the area Finnabarche. The five palace churches may be a hint about the architecture of the imperial dwelling. I imagine not a compact and high architectural facade of a single block-like building on the steep western slope, but several smaller separate buildings like a group of, per, like a group of pavilions in the, sum, uh, in the manner of Ottoman Köschkler or like the structures of the Great Palace. A secluded and intimate idyll, widely barren from the site, from the city. Only here from the side of Taksim, you can, uh, could have had a look down to the imperial uh, place. The life of Basil emphasizes that the palace at the sources was perhaps over the years a place for personal recreation of the emperor and his family, his children and his grandchildren. A come to land. A palace built by an emperor or by one of his immediate family members, e.g. his wife or children, remains as a rule in imperial hands over centuries. It is rare that an imperial palace is transferred to other uses. But we heard two examples, the palace in Kandili became a monastery or Frauenhaus and um, called Methanoia, or Hagios Mamas became an extra-urban quarter of the Russian merchants. They are actually the only, these are the, actually the only references for change. 
some of the other places fell after centuries into decay without any conversion like parts of the Great Palace or perhaps the Blacherne Palace in Ivanserai. But in most cases, we have no sources about the further fate of the buildings. Theoretically, the real estate remained in the hands of the imperial treasury. In the case of the palace of sources, there is a reminiscence by Evlia Celebi. Evlia Celebi tells us that there was near Tersane, formerly a royal vineyard in the time of the infidels. That means it was still in imperial hand till the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Afterwards, it was a Hasbachche, that means a royal garden. The work, the research work on the summer palaces is part of a larger research project and study about the notion and the wide range and understanding of Benedictine palaces. There exists no, not only palaces in and around Constantinople, but there are also palaces of the, of the governors in the large military conscriptions, the Temata in the leading cities of Asia Minor and the Balkans, for instance, in Thessaloniki, in Izmit, in Amorion, in Rhodes, in Ataleya, Antalya, Silifke, Silayan, and other places. There's a whole world of palaces in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. The urban, the social, and the political impact of the palaces on the Bosphorus and the Marmara region in Byzantine times becomes slowly a clearer picture and a part of the incredible urban history. The Middle Byzantine society and the imperial dynasties continued their lifestyle on the seashores. They are either, they are, these seashores are their stage for representation. This seaside color and this seaside culture ends with the sack of the city in 1204. The Bosphorus and the northern shores of the Marmara were the Belvedere of the city, the urban extension beyond the walls. We are entitled to assume that over nearly a million of Byzantine history, the imperial families used, beside the great palace and the palace of Brachana in Ivanserai, a wide range of state palaces for their official and private interests and purposes. These profane palaces were places of political, social, military, diplomatic, and ecclesiastical gatherings and decisions. The places and the palaces were places of receptions, feasts, banquets, marriages, and child bearings, places of love affairs and murder. These palaces were stages of Byzantine history and a mirror of human place. They are gone, and they are gone more than 40 of such palaces, but we get glimpses of their role within the Constantinopolitan cosmos. I thank you, and I wish you a pleasant evening. Much for for this uh, very interesting presentation. <coughs> I think the uh, audience might have some questions for you. <laughs> so, uh, why invited? Can you please mention about the palace, uh, the remains of the palace at Samandra? <laughs> um, I didn't use the word except on one, on one page. Uh, the world of architecture, because uh, architecture is the whole new lecture. Yeah? We have some more than 40 um, palaces. The most far away is the place of Bursa, 
nearer we have Yalova Thermal and in the surrounding Constantinople, all so-called summer palaces in the sense of uh, summer pal uh, palaces um, at Taravia of the ambas ambassadors of that century. But from all these over 40 palaces, we have only from a very few remains. That is Samandira, in my belief also Doreas um, there is um, Eski Sar, um, and um, we have in Harami Dere, near the Ef uh, Besh, uh, um, um, mm -hmm. Ebesh, uh, or uh, um, Europe uh, World, um, at um, Aftjila, uh, some ruins, but most are gone. And the literary sources never describe any. Um, um, but we have a mansion for Samandia, and that says that uh, one of uh, uh, a Byzantine general went up to the second story. <laughs> <laughs> that tells us that the, the ruins had a second story, and what we see there in Samandira is only the first story. Yeah. Um, but Samandira takes really another uh, large um, lecture. And therefore, I left out the question of uh, architecture because we have a change of architecture from the broad form of uh, um, wide uh, palaces, not only like the Great Palace, but also the uh, Kazim Pasha uh, Dolatere, but up to these single-storied palaces like Eskisa or Harabida and others. That's in the time of the 12th century. Um, but it's all over the Mediterranean, for instance, Sicily, we have these uh, type of um, tower houses where the whole imperial family lived. I asked myself how they lived uh, in such small uh, rooms, uh, not bigger than this uh, uh, room here. Uh, or if you take Nymphean uh, Nif near Manisa. Um, I'm just curious about what are, what is our concrete evidence for the uh, use of the palace in Ayos Mamas by the Russian merchants. I mean, we know that the Russian merchants were given uh, uh, or were told to uh, stay there uh, in, in Ayos Mamas, but uh, I always thought it was sort of a mention of the neighborhood, of the quarter. Uh, but is there concrete evidence is, that it uh, was the palace that was given to them, or they were told? Uh, it is they said, were the source has said, Hayos Mamas was given them. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not uh, said the palace has given them, but there's no other choice. Yeah? And you know, um, the Russians were only allowed to go into the city In 50, 50 persons uh -huh. maximum. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, they were uh, counted uh, on the um, in Emin Udu, where the, the end of the city, um, and they had to leave the, the night. So they had, they needed a quarter. And apparently, uh, the empress left some palaces um, uh, because the tastes seemed to have changed. So once my uh, ah, sorry. you mentioned this double column, yeah, and I'm thinking about I don't know if maybe it's a silly connection, but late in later Byzantine period there's supposed to be a deep Lokionion yeah. somewhere nearby that is yeah. I think in Comnenian period is going to be used as a some kind of a landing spot. The Are we talking about the same or no? No, no it's not. And the difference <coughs> between where we uh, set the Diplocurion and um, the pillar of uh, the double pillar of Daniel, Daniel that must be as the crow flies some four four and a half kilometers at least or even more. Okay. 
Thanks. And there's nothing left. In uh, St. Simeon, in, uh, uh, in his monastery near Antioch, we have at least parts of the column. Mm -hmm. Here we have nothing. Yeah. I would like to know um, how many imperial estates or palaces are you calculating for the uh, for the prosperous side, and at the moment. And uh, then the other question is, um, this, um, you didn't say that directly, but um, you gave somehow the impression, at least to me, that um, uh, when all this area was already full at just a time that. Um, there was not much change in the um, use of this landscape or of this area anymore at the later time until 1204. Um, was it your uh, was it your meaning? Also, did I get that right? Um, I can't say any, uh, anything about t uh, 1204 um, because we have nearly no. Um, um, in the sources, no mention of palaces. The last ones are in Geoffroy de Villagrain, uh, in his um, uh, 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 telling about the Fourth uh, Crusade and the arrival of um, um, cruisers here. And he mentions the uh, Andronicos Palace in um, Calico and Andronicos Palace at Uskudar. Um, but uh, beyond, we know nothing in time. Um, and uh, what was the, the other part of the question? How many palaces? <laughs> Actually, I, I count in total some 42, 43. Yeah, it's quite it, it, uh, I have some four or, five, uh, four or five, mostly hunting palaces without name. In all in the Bosporus side or in the hinterland too? For instance, that um, there's one beyond um, uh, at the edge of the Belgard uh, woods called Pyrgos. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, uh, and the name tells us that it must be a tower place, um, a tower house, and not more, uh, from the late 12th century. And it was destroyed two years after it was built. Uh, even, therefore, it was mentioned. Uh, um, most of them are on the seashores, and our problem is that I try to explain, for instance, for Tarabia, that that we have often only one single source, <coughs> um, and that is that is the work of a historian to to reconstruct. Uh, what could be happened. But for the 6th century, um, that we see, for instance, in Kirkup's secret history, um, the, the largest um, the contractor in real estate was uh, the emperor. And he took uh, um, city palaces from uh, um, people and gave it to others. And there were, for instance, also an unknown um, um, number of city policies, for instance, for ambassadors. When Louis Brandt uh, came in the 10th century to Likofos for Cars, he was in a palace that he says himself, but we can't say where it is. We know only that he was. Uh, um, Upset because on the one side it was cold, he said, and on the other side he said it was too hot in the palace. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about the remains at the Dragos? How we at? Dragos. Ah, yeah, no. There are hints that in Brias, multiple. We have at least two, perhaps three uh, palaces. And that might be the, ex uh, the excavations at Dragos are not wide enough by uh, uh, Alpay Pastini and his uh, nice uh, publication about. Um, but it, 
from the feeling. I can't prove it. But the feeling, it is also a prominent sign with a view to the uh, Principo of the islands and so on um, for, um, for a palace on the shore, seashore. I would uh, wish I would come nearer to, to the problem, um, but I can only uh, say there are ruins, and um, but it's not enough to say, oh, it's a very large estate. We can uh, try to name it as a palace. So I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you.